Welcome to the Lift Your Story podcast with guest Meg Nacero, author, attorney, and podcaster. Hi, everyone. I am Lorianne. I am that gal from Milton, Ontario, Canada, and I am with... I am that guy. I am Roy Miller from Dallas, Texas. Welcome to our Lift Your Story podcast. In this episode, we have Meg Nacero, and she is an author, attorney, and podcaster, and thank you so much for being with us today. Oh my God, it's a pleasure to be here and nice to meet both of you. Well, glad to have you. So tell us a little bit about your book, The Magical Guide to Bliss, and how you came about writing that book and the title. So it's, um, I, I like to believe that I'm a very magical person, so that just totally resonated with me. But the reality is, the book came because after I lost my mom to breast cancer in April of 2011, it, it was just 10 years last week. Um, basically I, I, I totally felt lost. I felt like the ground underneath me had been like taken and I was falling into like a really dark place. And one of my good friends who knows I love to write, I love to journal. She suggested that maybe I should start having a conversation with my mom on a daily basis. And it turned into da daily insights where I would ask the question and I would channel whatever I would imagine her to tell me. And every day I kept writing and I kept writing. So it was this cathartic process. And then I started sharing my insights of the day with other people. So it became, you know, this daily email and then it became a daily blog. And then uh, this is really kind of a fun part of my story. Um, you know, you, we all are vulnerable with regard to whether or not we're good enough or we're, you know, we have a skill and that the world will love our skill and the good itself out there and God knows what the world will come back with, you know, but I was really contemplating putting it into a book form. And then uh, I actually, a dream of mine came true. Literally, I found myself on stage with Oprah Winfrey in 2014. And in front of 15,000 people, she looks to me after this whole like unfolding. And I was just like waving to the audience. It was surreal. I have to tell you, what are those moments in life? You're just like, okay, I gotta be paying attention. And she looked at me and she said, it's time to live the life of your dreams. And I was like, well, I, I have to publish my book. And one of the titles that I was working with um, was Magical Guide to Bliss. And it was generally proven that it was my magical guide to help me out of the darkness in my life toward a more blissful, satisfying experience in this world. So it pretty much is my guide that I get to share with other people if they like it, yay. <laughs> so it's really kind of that kind of blessing, a blessing, a blessing. Well. How many people have have read your book or you've talked to about your experience with your mom at the yeah. writing book and come back to you and said, oh, wow, I wish I would have thought of this or, or, you know, you really helped me get through something from reading your book. You know, have you got that kind of feedback? Yeah, you know, when I first published it, I was like, if one person likes it, I'm good. And, you know, the one person that first came back as far as whether he liked it or not was my dad. And he actually said that he was going to write the foreword in my book. So it became this beautiful healing of many relationships in my life. And after that, you know, the unfolding of the different relationships that have been established because of the book, because I got to put it out there, has been an amazing experience because I hoped I would help one person, you know, help themselves and it's become you know, I have a lot of people following me on social media. You know, some people I have met over Facebook and we've become friends over the years. So it's really been an amazing uh, unfolding and opening up of my life. So I'm really grateful to that. And it was one of the things that helped me basically take the leap of faith, leaving my former career into what I'm doing now. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing how your experience and your journey has an impact on so many other people that you have no idea that it, that it would. And it probably goes to, goes to your show as well when you know, you're encouraging other people to lift their story and you come every week with someone new that you never know who you're going to impact just by virtue of being vulnerable to that you know, calling that you're feeling compelled to show up as. You know, there's so many people that'll come back around saying, I didn't give up because of you. I kept moving further, further because of you, or I followed my dreams because of you. And, and what a gift to be given when you, 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 your intention was to do that, to help others as well as help yourself, because I'm going to be honest, it was really my guide. It helped me out of the darkness. It 
and the benefit was to help others along. And that's basically what life is about, you know, finding that healing space and then giving permission to others to do the same with their lives as well, heal and move on, which is, I mean, what a, ga- what a gift, right? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's all about finding your purpose. Yes. Right? For sure. You know. not, not going into, into it thinking that, but then in the journey of doing it, you realize, you know, this is what I'm meant to do. This is what I should be doing. Yeah. You know, I, I love the quote by Shakespeare, and it's all the world's a stage, men and women coming in and out, entering and exiting, and we have seven stages, right? And every stage, you know, you hit your ebbs and your flows, and at the end of your days, you know, we only have a beginning and an end, but it's what you do with that legacy during the interim, right? And how you show up in the interim, that you write your own story, you write your own narrative, and you can recreate something that you thought you may have lost, but in your next stage, you can say, I, I, I haven't given up on that dream. And you continue to go forward with those callings, those purposeful hits and those people that you align with that open the doors to possibility, which is amazing. You know, I've always been a believer that, that angels come into your life uh-huh. and they can, they're just people that show up at the time you need them to show up. They're there they may be gone and may stay from now on, but, but, you know, you're always thinking, oh, I wish so and so all of a sudden there's somebody there that helps you with that problem. I, I totally know. agree. I, you know, it's amazing. Angels all over the place. <laughs> and so, you know, in effect, you're, you're somebody else's angel. You know, I, I, you know, I like to believe that, you know, sometimes you think the other, <laughs> so, you know, we all, like I said to you guys before, I said, we always show up doing our best. Maybe today it was not as our, you know, shiniest, but it was the best we got for that day. So giving yourself a lot of permission to be human is, yeah. is a really nice thing too. <laughs> yeah. and here I thought, Roy, you were talking about me being the angel. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm sure he has stories how you are his angel, Lori. I'm sure that it will be it is. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah we, I, we, we help each other for sure. Absolutely. Uh, I find it quite compelling that your dad wrote the foreword. That almost put me in tears. That must have been quite uh, emotional for him to even read through your memoirs. Um, you know, so I just, how did, he, how did he feel? I just, I'm having that question of, that, that's, so, so The Magical Guide is my first book in a trilogy. So I have three books now. It was kind of this vision that came to me the magic, after I finished The Magical Guide to Bliss. I had a second book called Sparkle and Shine. It's a book of affirmations, 108 mantras to lighten your way and brighten your day. And then my last one is my memoir. It's called Butterfly Awakens. It's a, tran- it's a memoir of transformation through grief. But as far as my first book in the foreword, he told me, this is the greatest story because I always say, pay attention to your dreams. And I had bothered him and bothered him because I had seen um, Brian Weiss. And I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he wrote a book. He, he was, he's one of these psychiatrists who did, um, he talked about the dreams and how to go, um, it's called regression therapy, you know, where they take people back. So I saw him and he was speaking with his daughter. Apparently he wrote a book with his daughter and that was what he was presenting on. So it just hit me. I was like, I have to have my dad part of this experience because I feel like not only will it heal me, but he lost his wife too. And that was really, really impacting to him. I mean, my God, his partner for over 45 years, married 50 together. I, I, I don't imagine, you know, and I was having a hard time as her daughter, but that was his life partner. And I had asked him and he's not a writer, he's a cardiologist. So you can only imagine, but my dad is a jack of all trades. He is a philosopher. He's a theologian. He has so many different facets to him. And I think that makes us all, my family, very curious people. The education cone is really paramount in how we all strive to really learn more about this world. Certainly words for me. I just love playing with words. But um, when I asked him, he told me he had woken up at three o'clock in the morning and he just basically downloaded what he wrote. And what came out was just stunning. You know, the, it was the perfect beginning to my, my guide because it was as if he really saw my relationship with my mother and he put the perfect words to paper to inspire others, invite them also to to take that journey, which, you know, I literally, you know, pushed him to do it, but yeah, he was so grateful. And, you know, he's a big (laughs) proponent as well because he, a lot of the quotes I use in the book are very profound philosophers and 
and writers. And I, I read like over 400 books in one year to get all the quotes and the insights. So it was a great conversation I had with him too, which has been really, like I said, healing for our relationship because I was not as close to my dad as I was to my mom. So that's a, a beautiful benefit, right? The whole angels, you know, he became my <laughs> angel and, and vice versa. It's amazing life, right? My, it just surprises you all the time. Did, did he have a hard time doing it? Did he say? So I, I don't, I, I think that he, he really, when he wrote that, he just basically downloaded what he had come up with. He just woke up at three o'clock in the morning and just wrote it. And, and that, I think it was up to that point. I think he didn't want to do it. And then when he got woken, <laughs> like at three o'clock in the morning, I guess you just say yes. I guess I could be really persistent. Maybe I, you know, maybe my mother beyond was haunting him too. And, and he woke him up and said, do this for your daughter. I don't know. I'd like to think that she's a kind of humorist now, but um, you know, he, um, he hasn't read my memoir yet. And the memoir does depict a three stages. Um, I, I, I use the metaphor of the butterfly. It's very profound for me because in my family, we believe that, you know, a butterfly show up and that's how our, you know, passed on relatives show up in the world. We, when I see butterflies, I think that's my mother. Um, so I use the whole um, metaphor of, you know, the, the caterpillar, you know, when she was very ill and how she went into her own cocoon, emerging, emerging her own butterfly when she passed. But that was the beginning of my part one, my journey of having the loss and then going through the whole grieving process as a cocoon, how that transformation, you, you kind of have to trust the process and your earth angels do show up. I don't know how I would have survived that had I not been paying attention and being the observer to seeing, you know, the ask, someone help me, I need help. And then people showing up to do that out of the love of their own hearts or, or because they've had those experiences as well. And then the final is, I actually wrote the end. It's about um, El Camino de Santiago in Spain. So I actually walked the pilgrimage in Spain. The, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but back in the day, um, many people started, and I think it was the eighth century, um, to walk this pilgrimage to get to the remains of Santiago St. James in uh, Santiago de Compostela. And Compostela means under the stars. So it's a very spiritual experience. It could be just something to challenge yourself, but um, that's the ending. That's where, you know, you truly realize how strong you are. And I got a message at the end too, but I'm not going to spoil it. I'll let you guys read it for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I usually spoil everything. I don't like to wait for the ending myself. I don't like surprises. I was like, even with a movie, I'll watch the ending just so I can sit through it. And at least I enjoy that, but everyone else gets really mad at me. <laughs> so I try not to spoil endings. <laughs> Oh, that reminds me there was a movie of some sort that there was somebody who always read the end of the book before they started and somebody said why they go because if I die along the way I won't know the ending or it was oh my god that's awesome like, ah. <laughs> at the very end of the uh, of the movie I believe that he did start from start to finish it was kind no, of a did. little you know pointer on that but I just figure life is so uncertain as it is. If I'm feeling this suspense build up and I know that the ending is going to be unsatisfying, I might just drop the book. <laughs> I'm just like, you know. So yes, people do yell at me in my book club. They're like, how could you do that? And I'm like, hey, hey everybody shows up authentically themselves. I have lived this long in my skin to understand that that is my pattern and my process. So I'm good with it. <laughs> yeah, I, I was always one. If I started a book, I wanted to finish it, you know. And there's been a couple that, you know, we were on an airplane coming back from vacation. And this last 50 pages of this book, it was about, you know, the people were stranded and they were cannibalizing each other. And I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I was like, uh, well, I was sitting there, I, was, I, I don't know if I can finish it. But I, I ended up finishing it, but it was, it was hard to do because I was like, oh, oh, this is dude, it's, you know, kind of creepy, but. As an author, I definitely appreciate when people do finish the, <laughs> the book. So I promised myself that at the end of this book, I was going to give some people something that they could take away that would actually lighten their soul and their spirit as well. So if you do get my book at the end, you will feel good. I promise you, you might not like the beginning or the middle, like, ah, but at the end, it'll be a really wonderful takeaway for sure. Roy, the book you were reading reminds me, it sounds like a, uh, an adult version of Lord of the Flies. <laughs> yes, wrong. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or Game oh. of Thrones. I don't know. At least, you know, I don't know which one he was reading. But yeah, I was thinking Lord of the Flies. <laughs> well, I mean, this was like the seventh book this guy had written. Yeah, I've read all of them and they were all good. But this one, 
I was like, oh my gosh, you know. You know what I like to do though? I always like to get the perspective of the author during the times upon which they were writing because it impacts the story so greatly. So, you know, everyone, I like to learn about the author. If it's like, what happened? What the heck happened? You know, they took a flight, man. I don't know. Maybe somebody actually, you know, he was angry. <laughs> they just took it out on their book. I don't know, but it's always an interesting story behind the story. That's a good point, mate, because when we are learning about books in school, I mean, the Lord of the Flies would probably not have been one that I would have picked as something to read. But it's interesting that what, whatever we were given the the book about, there was a little bit of a segment prior to that our that our teachers would tell us this was written because of yeah. this. So yeah. at least you have a segue into it, and it makes you want to finish it more, like you said, than had it just been I don't know where this is going. <laughs> you just put it down. I have a few that are. I'm bad. My mother's like you, Roy. If she reads a book, she's got to finish it. Me, if I get like halfway through and I'm still not there, it just goes back on my shelf and I'll go maybe some other day or never. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like it's like for me, Stephen King. Now, I did read The Stand, uh, and that was a really good book. But but a lot of his stuff is just a bit too dark for me. But my wife and one of my sons, they like him because they say he's so descriptive. I mean, you. You can, you, yeah. everything he says, you just, you can just, it just comes to you. You know, like you, she says, it's like sitting there in, in the, in the story yourself. I mean, he talks about the trees and you're looking at the tree. You can feel the trees. And, and, you know, she said, that's one thing she likes about him is he's so descriptive. He can like pull you right into the story. Yeah, but I think I'm creepy for me. <laughs> I think I'm more in line with what Meg is writing than this Stephen King. I do. I watched horrors when I was in my mid-teens, and I swore after about the first year of doing that, I'd never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I, you know, literally, I get terrified. I, I feel like when you're, if you're putting me there and I feel it, it's your, you know, you go in the mind, you're going your body. And I'm like, what the heck would I do? Like, it's like you wonder why you like, subject yourself to, like, punishment. But Stephen Clinton, see, he's a classic. So, you know, if that's, if that's something that, I mean, he's definitely, I'm not even, I mean, a great writer no 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 problem with that but at the same time i'd like to sleep <laughs> without having haunting for sure really yeah. i think after pet cemetery i was like that's it <laughs> i was like the animals the animals are going to kill me i can't no i can't i i can't i just couldn't do it i was like oh sorry i have to say this really quick because you're talking about animals okay that brought me quickly back to hitchcock and then one of the movies I watched, The Birds, which is really hokey now, but when I watched it, I would think I was like seven or eight years old, and it freaked me out. And now when you see flocks of birds, you kind of go, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's true, so right? It's true. I mean, if, if, if you know, I mean, showers? Yeah. <laughs> Be like, no, the birds are coming. Oh my God. No, absolutely. Ah. I agree. I agree. So you're a we were a federal prosecutor as well, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I you know, it's funny because I'd like to say it was the best role I ever played, like literally an acting role, because, you know, the bottom line is you're for as a prosecutor, you're poking holes in cases all the time to make sure that there's credibility, that they're able to sustain their burden of proof. And for 20, almost 20 years, I sat there listening to people's stories. And sometimes they were really good storytellers, you know, maybe that they got the narrative on point and they weren't able to, you know, flub them up and, and kind of fall on their face. And sometimes it was just a mess. I mean, like a mess. So the bottom line is, you know, one of the cool things about storytelling, and I'm, I imagine, you know, since it's a podcast that you can't see the body language, but if you're in person and you're seeing it on the YouTube when you watch someone's facial expressions and the way that they hold their hands, like some people, when they try to lie, they'll start to cover their mouth. And it's just the body protecting you from yourself. But I was so fascinated by, you know, the whole soci you know, the whole, uh, the, the psychology of that, I would study it. So I knew when I saw someone like doing something, you know, that would be a tell from their body, that I, there was a lie coming. And then I would just hone in and get them. And that was, you know, that would literally after 20 years, I started not to believe anybody <laughs> what they were saying to me. So I thought maybe I need to step away <laughs> now because, you know, I, I, I just want to believe people are good. I really want to come from that place first. And not that these people were not good. A lot of them are really wonderful people. Their stories certainly weren't credible, but good people. <laughs> 
they were also not such great people as well. But I always believe in second chances. But, you know, as far as being a prosecutor, you know, it's an interesting role you play in a courtroom. And, and I, one of the blessings of that is I got to know the defense, you know, the attorneys. And also um, I got to know the judges really well because it was an administrative hearing. So it was just the, the two of us. And then there was no trial. There was no um, individuals on a trial jury or anything to that effect. But I think the coolest thing about that was to understand that you can have an impact on another person's life regardless of the role that you take. So wherever you show, it could be a teachable moment <laughs> for real, you know, and, and you know, there's a beautiful uh, quote by Etienne Grayer. She says that how, you know, whatever path you cross that day brings some kindness. So I always did try to do that, even if the person was terrified of me because literally I was sitting there in the prosecutor's chair. So, you know, after a while, you don't really like to see people scared of you. So I was just like, oh, maybe this is not really the role. And I'm really kind of a, you know, touchy feely, nice, positive person as well. So, you know, over, over time, I felt like I needed to do something else for my own growth. And so I didn't like shrivel up and wither away into something I wasn't proud of. So. Yeah. Just like if somebody makes a mistake, like they've got an itchy ear or they got a, an itchy mouth and you're just like, oh, you lie. Oh, it's so funny. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. Yeah, no, my kids have a terrible time with me because I was like, ah, you really want to go there before you even <laughs> open your mouth? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Warning is out there. Warning is out there. And yeah, well, sometimes they don't pay attention to the warning. Yeah. So they look, at, they look at it and go, mom. Are you going to believe your lying eyes or what I'm fixing to tell you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no kidding, right? Oh, God. And I have an 18-year-old and a 12-year-old. So let me tell you, there's some real oozy doozies that come at you. And you're just like, I can't. Not today. <laughs> Not today. There was something. Oh, you're Ms. CEO Entrepreneur of the Year. So yeah, in 2019. So I had um, the opportunity to meet this really amazing um, she's a brand ambassador and she does a lot of publicity for a lot of up and coming speakers and writers and um, as far as um, putting you out there in the world, getting you great publicity, learning to speak better, you know, as far as the, the podcasts are concerned and relating across the board with different audiences. And in 2019, I was given her, um, her award that year. It was really, I mean, you know, for me, you know, I was always working for the government for many years. So it was like working for someone is so different than being an entrepreneur. It's such a different world. And, and it's not for the faint of heart because you definitely have to keep going and learn from your mistakes and then, you know, put it all out there and see what you can do, what hits and what doesn't. So to have that kind of recognition was really special for me. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no kidding. So Shine Networking Incorporated. Yeah, I love my Shine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, what, what is Shine? So, you know, after the whole Oprah thing, I was so interested in keeping up. It was a Live the Life You Want event. So I wanted to renew that the next year as well. So I started this group called Shine, Spirit, Hope, Insight, a networking event. And what, oh my gosh, so it was the greatest. The first event was amazing because one of my favorite authors in the world, Pam Grout, who wrote the book E Squared. It's all these scientific experiments into manifesting the life of your dreams, the law of attraction, being very intentional. She actually, I really got lucky because she actually said yes, that she would come and speak as well as Amy Butler from Blossom Magazine. She's a designer, so she does a ton, a ton of textiles. She's an amazing artist. So I had these wonderful speakers and I had about 150 people for my first time um, this event where we just got to basically raise the vibration in Miami, you know, people get, getting together and, you know, finding other people who are looking to live a really more uplifting life. And then it turned into, um, I now give scholarships because I wanted to give back and especially to the young creatives in the community. Um, so now we, we made it into a nonprofit and then we give scholarships to young innovative leaders in the community have really great ideas and who are, you know, you know, as kids, you're wondering whether or not you can make a difference, but we find people who are doing great things, these young kids, and we, we recognize them and we give them educational scholarships. So when they go out into the world, you know, of, of higher education or even um, trades that at least they know that, you know, there are ambassadors, we see them, we recognize what they're doing and we support them. So 
it's been really wonderful. And I, because I love Broadway, I love the art. So generally a lot of them have a lot to do with having that kind of, you know, creative event where they're performers and, you know, they're doing uh, wonderful things like um, one group, um, one, two of the kids that we honored um, had uh, raised money for LGBTQ homeless youth in Miami. They did a whole review. So we recognized their initiative and then so on and so on. It's been six years. This will be our sixth year that we're doing the ambassador program with Shine. Well, that's pretty incredible. That is. Now, now Miami's got a pretty good nightlife there, right? Oh, yeah. Are you coming anytime soon? <laughs> <laughs> sadly, my only experience in Miami is the airport. Ah, sadly. That is <laughs> clearly not the... Well, it's actually quite interesting. Miami airport is definitely in and of itself is... Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I only have one question about the Miami airport. How come you come in at one end and no matter where you're going, you have to go all the way across the airport to, to fly out? Yeah. Not being in. <laughs> come in one end and your flight is like, they say, Where, where's the, well, go down there. Just keep going to you go right over the horizon. That's where your flight is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they want they want to make sure you get some exercise between flights. I no suppose, joke. Right? <laughs> no joke. You're not kidding there. You're not kidding. If you're there. late, you might have a problem. <laughs> you might have a big problem, but otherwise, right? So can oh. I just, Oh, sorry. I just had a quick no. question, though, because you said six years now going. So how did this, I know it's kind of an overused thing now, but how did it work out for during last year with with COVID? Oh, yeah, so last year um, we got innovated ourselves. Um, one of my board members, um, who happens to be my husband, um, <laughs> um, had come up with the idea that we donate um, laptops um, because everybody went virtual. We found individuals in the community where it's called over oh, the Overtown Optimist Club, and they there were 20 of the seniors that um, are graduating with that club. And usually, like I said to you guys, it was some some people who are doing things that are trying to uplift the the community, uplift the city. So what they were doing during COVID were a lot of outreach programs to the you know the senior citizens. They were you know doing what they could. Um, in many different um, respects. And we connected with, um, it's another organization that I'm actually involved with as well, Sisters in Spirit. And they do a lot of fundraising for the, um, the underserved um, community, underprivileged community. And we decided to do this thing called Partners in Progress. So Partners for Progress, where we, we picked the 20, we started mentoring them. We provided them, um, Shine Networking Inc. provided them with computers, laptops. We, we, that was our scholarship offering. It was the laptops so that they could actually do virtual school while we were locked down so they wouldn't miss a beat in their senior year and they'd actually get to graduate. But we've been monitoring and mentoring them over the year where we had um, different um, Zoom mentoring calls where we presented a panel on lawyers. We did a panel on uh, you know all these different ideas and things that came up. And now in this May, because it's opening up, obviously Miami and, and, and Florida is more open than other places, we're going to get together and do a final presentation, you know, um, as a culmination of the year, you know, to finish up our partners for progress and our, because those are our, were our shine ambassadors for the year was the Overtown Optimist Club seniors. So it worked out really well. We did do a presentation for them in person. It was definitely social distance and, and very safe um, where we presented them with the laptops. But, you know, we, you know, got a little innovative this year. We didn't have our huge event like we normally do to the fundraising, but we did, we were able to continue with the scholarship portion of it. So I was really happy. That was really wonderful. And, you know, that to give back that way during this year, you know, certainly felt really good, which, you know, it's never a bad thing. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Perfect. So Meg, how can our registrants reach out to you? So I have a website. It's www.megnocero.com, M-E-G-N-O-C-E-R-O.com. I'm all over social media. I've been on social media for a long time. I love Instagram because 
visuals are like one of my favorite things. So at it's at Meg Nasero on Instagram also um, in uh, Facebook. I'm there as well on LinkedIn as well. Um, I am available as a coach. I'm available, you know, with my books. If people are interested in my books, I will provide signed copies. Um, if they connect through my, my webpage, you can get the link there. And no, I'm just, it's just everywhere. So, <laughs> so everywhere. And they can keep their eyes open because my launch is in September 2021 of my memoir, which I'm super excited that uh, Butterflies Awaken, a Butterfly Awakens. So um, that's going to be launched on social media as well as other, other um, social media sites as well. Right. Right. I love the title, by the way. Oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Great. Well, Hello. thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Love the smile and the happy nature. This is really fun. Thank you. No, thank you so much for the opportunity. You guys are wonderful. I enjoyed lifting the story today. <laughs> Great. Appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure meeting you. Take nice care. to meet you guys too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode. Be sure to visit us at lifterstory.com.